welcome to our heritage. I'm Rashid Best. As this series continues to celebrate with our people, today we will learn of the experiences of two outstanding Barbadians and the many ways in which they inspired this nation. We are grateful to Professor Sir Henry Fraser, who delights in educating us about our heritage. As the adage goes, we cannot know where we are going if we do not know where we have come from. This information will certainly inspire young Barbadians to be the change they wish to see. Over to you, Sir Henry. Now, Clennell Wickham is a most interesting man. He took over the Herald newspaper back in the era of post-First World War from the man who founded it, Clement Innes. And Clement Innes was a radical writer. Clennell Wickham was even more radical. He was a man of the people, for the people. And he edited this newspaper and he had a magnificent pen. And the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword, worked well for Clennell Wickham for quite a while because he raised the consciousness of Barbadians about what life should be like. And he made the clear distinction between the people who were running the country for themselves and the vast numbers of people who were living really subsistence lives and had lived in that way for a century since emancipation. It was what I call the dark century. And one of my favorite books is a little book that John Wickham put together. Now, John Wickham was the son of Clennell Wickham, and he illustrates the fact that so many professions are carried on by fathers, sons, and even grandsons, and in the family, as it were, because John was the son of Clennell, and John's nephew, of course, Peter Wickham, is the well-known modern-day journalist and media man. But Clennell Wickham wrote a collection of, should I say, pen portraits of prominent people, especially parliamentarians. And John Wickham put together a book, a collection of these, called A Man with a Fountain Pen. All of his father's writings and his father's publications were put together under pen and ink sketches and other essays of Barbadian politicians, first published in the Herald back in 1921. And Clennell was really quite an amazing man. Uh, he was described by John in the foreword of this book as a man for all time. And I particularly like the essay that John included in this book, which was, there were two essays really, in addition to his own introduction and the story of his father, uh, living with his father and going to the Clennell Wickham Herald offices on Saturday mornings, where he was in the presence of all the distinguished people like A.N. Ford of the day, and heard all the politics and got into the political fray where Clennell Wickham's office of the newspaper was the center for political discussion in, in Barbados. And I liked what Sir Alexander Hoyas, who taught me history, wrote about Clennell Wickham. He used this term, the quotation which John included, that Wickham's own words would be remembered long after the mouths of his opponents were stopped with dust. That's Sir Alexander Hoyas's eloquence. And then there was the essay by Sir James Tudor, Cammy Tudor, and Sir James described Clennell Wickham as a guiding light. John Wickham chose a really fascinating variety of, of pen portraits of all of these people, and he, he had an acerbic pen, I should say. The things that he wrote were humorous, but they were also eloquent, they were often metaphorical, and they were very frequently very sarcastic and hit home about the personalities. He praised some of these people and he excoriated others. There were actually some good men in Parliament, according to Clennell Wickham, balancing the most appalling people. And he wrote with admiration of Mr. Walter Rees, who was a King's Counsel, the equivalent of a Queen's Counsel today, and the Solicitor General, Dr. Um, Mr. Douglas Pyle. And Mr. Douglas Pyle was the chairman of the old hospital board. And then Sir Herbert Graves, who was the Chief Justice, and Sir Randall Phillips, who was another very, very distinguished man, and the kind of man who was not a hero because he never suffered. 
but he was a man who worked for the people and provided a lot of free care, and that's why we have the Randall Phillips Polyclinic named after him. But John, uh, sorry, Clennell Wickham's Turner phrase is really quite magnificent. And I liked this particular extract from the little book where he wrote that the man who, um, member who he says, quote, no member of the house perspires so profusely and he puts more physical effort into the transaction of business in the House of Assembly than all of the other members put together. He relies on a conversational style of speaking and a store of inappropriate reminiscences and anecdotes with which to disguise the lack of depth which he exhibits. And you may well suggest that uh, that description from the 1920s might well apply to one or two of our prominent people today, but I'm not going to name anyone. I think that this book should be a required text in our secondary schools towards the end of the course in order to teach people something about the use of the pen. Clennell's pen was dangerous, but then it became his undoing because eventually one of the very, uh, should I say, excoriating pieces that he wrote led to his being sued for libel. And the extent to which he might have been a victim of prejudice and bigotry and dislike for what he was writing for led to his being fined something like $20,000, which was about the equivalent of his earnings for two years at the newspaper. In those days, I mean, these were the days when you bought a dozen eggs for a penny. And so $20,000 was a huge sum of money. And he was forced to close down his newspaper. He went bankrupt and he literally fled the country and he went down to Grenada. He was not, um, what's the word? He was not brought out of Grenada to, 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 to be put in prison for his debts, but he went to Grenada and eventually got a modest job. He, he lived on the charity of friends in, Jamaica, in, in Grenada. And eventually, rather sadly, at the age of 43, he had a ruptured appendix and there were no decent surgeons in Grenada at that time. And so he died at a very young age because of inadequate surgery. Who knows why his appendix ruptured? We, we don't understand that. But here was a man who had sacrificed everything and who lost everything because he had to go down to Grenada. His wife had to stay here to look after the children. And he, he, he suffered very badly and died very young. This was a man whose heroism in what he wrote led to an early death and a very really prominent, for Barbados, unique case of, of sacrificing everything for his beliefs. So I do, really do believe that just as the first committee of which I was a member and the second committee of which I was a member on National Heroes both recommended that Clennell Wickham was an obvious national hero and yet he was not given that title. I live in hope. Hmm. Very interesting indeed. Sir Henry goes on to chronicle the experiences of another celebrated Barbadian. He is commonly referred to as T.T. Lewis. You will learn of the remarkable contributions of the late T.T. Lewis to the development of Barbados. Sir Henry? Athol Edwin Seymour Lewis, A.E.S. Lewis. And I suspect that Owen Arthur's mother may have admired him because you remember Owen's middle name was Seymour. And it's a very unusual name in Barbados. I have never come across another Seymour. It's rather like Joseph Nathaniel Goddard, the founder of the Goddard Empire. When I was an intern at the hospital in 1969, there were dozens of old Barbadians called Joseph Nathaniel Broom and Joseph Nathaniel Best and Joseph Nathaniel you know, there were just dozens of them because that man was a kind man and much admired. And so, uh, such a long name, Athol, who would ever heard of that name? Uh, he was known as T.T. throughout his life, T.T. And we don't know why he was given the name T.T. But T.T. was born the son of an overseer at a small plantation in St. John at Airy Hill. And his father was not satisfied with what was going on, and he had several children, 
and he decided to move to town. And he moved to town and lived at the poor end of Kensington New Road. And he was not really successful. He couldn't get a good job. And he did what uh, Jane Goddard did. He was known as a cow chauffeur, a speculator. He would buy a cow in the country for $5 and walk it to town on a rope and sell it for $10. That was old man Lewis's way of living. And eventually he got fed up with this. And when T.T. When was a young child, uh, his old man just emigrated to New York and was never heard from again, apparently. T.T. never knew him after that. And T.T. was a, obviously a bit of a rebel child because the story goes that he left home at the age of 10 and he simply cotched with all of his friends he had enough friends, he was such a personality, that he would simply find a bed all over Bridgetown with friends. He went to primary school, we assume, he learned to read, and we think that he went to St. Mary's School because that would have been the nearest boys' school, St. Mary's Boys' School, which is now a ruin. And he grew up teaching himself. He must have benefited hugely from the Carnegie Library, the public library, children's section, and he educated himself. He never went to a secondary school. And when Sir James Tudor returned from Oxford, now Sir James Tudor was a man of great privilege. His father had established shops all over Barbados and made a great deal of money, had many, many children, as you know, with his two wives. And Sir James was a privileged youth who went to Oxford. He did a degree at Oxford in English, and he was so eloquent that he was made the first black president of the Oxford Union, the union which was the debating society at Oxford. And that was a very, very eminent post. People, people who became president of the Oxford Union went on to become prime ministers and leading parliamentarians in Britain. So Sir James came back in 1945, and he is quoted in the book about T.T. Lewis, his biography, as saying that T.T., when he met him, was the most informed man he had ever met. He had learnt so much about Barbados and the world as his own tutor. And that from, T from Sir James Tudor was praise indeed. T.T. made all kinds of friends. He took part in dramatic performances, debating societies, and he went everywhere in Barbados because he was just such a popular person. He was rather like the great Jack Dare, whom everybody wanted to entertain because Jack Dare, with his stories, was the greatest storyteller in the whole of Barbados. So he never wanted for a dinner invitation. <laughs> and Titi was like that. But Titi lived in a very modest house. He married and he had three daughters. But he fought for the rights of poor people. And he rented a house and at that time, in the 1930s and 40s, there was something called the occupancy tax, where the occupant who was renting paid a tax for renting. So it was a question of, uh, <laughs> you know, he who, he who has nothing has it all taken away. And Titi fought for this. He got elected to the House of Assembly eventually, and from that position he had some influence. And he went and he talked to E.D. Motley, who was, of course, as we know, the most powerful man in Bridgetown in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And it was E.D. Motley who was persuaded by T.T. Lewis to abolish this ancient and unfair and cruel tax on the poor. That was the occupancy tax. T.T.'s other absolutely passionate fight was the fight for free education. And he said over and over and over again in Parliament and on the political platforms that Barbados must have free education, both primary and secondary. And again, if I can quote him, what he said was, there should be free education in all schools, elementary and secondary. And Sir James Tudor, who was given the privilege and the opportunity of introducing free secondary education after the Errol Barrow Democratic Labour Party government won the election in 1961 and he was made Minister of Education. He said, and as quoted in Gary Lewis's biography of T.T., he said that T.T. Lewis alone must be ascribed the original thinking on free education. As minister, he said, 
it was easy because TT had laid the groundwork and TT must take all the credit. Well, as we all know, the Democratic Labour Party has taken all the credit and most of it has gone to Sir James Tudor, who was the minister. But in his words, it was TT who was fighting for it between 1944 and 1964 when he made his first, his most prominent famous speech in, in, on the platform about it. For 20 years, TT's words obviously influenced people. And of course, free secondary education came in and it had an impact on all of the private schools that had grown up. The biggest impact it had, of course, was on Louis Lynch's school, the modern high school, which grew to a roll of 2000. But when free secondary education came in and the government started to build new secondary schools, then schools like the Bodden High School no longer had a role to play. So it only lasted nine years after Louis Lynch's death. But TT really deserves fame for that. But his greatest moment, in a sense, of drama, political change, the effect on the Barbadian public life and so on, came a little bit later. Because Titi was constantly preaching on the behalf of the poor people, he formed a union. It was called the Clark's Union for people working in Bridgetown. Shop assistants in those days, as Wickham had described, shop assistants were extremely poorly paid and they had to work long hours. And in those days, there was no overtime. He formed the Clark's Union and it was a large union. And the business people of Bridgetown did not like his talk. And so what they did, they got together and they decided that the central agency which employed him was going to fire him. They made up some Trump charges, they fired him, and all of the business people in Bridgetown got together and decided, we will not employ him again. So here was a man who was working, I'm not quite sure what his job was, but it was some sort of clerical job, in Bridgetown who could not get employment. And as a result of this, because at that time he had, was allied with Sir Grantley Adams. Now Sir Grantley Adams, as everyone knows, Sir Grantley Adams was the power man in that era before, before I would suppose E.D. Motley became so powerful, but Sir Grantley Adams was known as Moses. He was the leader of the people. And so the night after T.T. was fired, he held an evening nighttime meeting in Queen's Park and he threatened that he would shut down the country and the sugar industry, which normally began in the first week of January when we grow a heck of a lot more sugar cane, would not be able to start. Because all of this happened, you see, at the very end of December, like the 19th, I forget the exact date, around the 19th of December was when TT was fired. And I mean, this was such a vicious thing to do because it meant that he was fired just before Christmas. It meant that Christmas was completely tainted and he would not be able to celebrate Christmas adequately because there was no money, there was no usual Christmas bonus, there was nothing. So Sir Grantley Adams spoke in Queen's Park and said he was going to shut down the country unless Lewis was dealt with fairly. And the following day, something like 5,000 people marched and the day after through Bridgetown. So this was the biggest event in Barbados literally since emancipation. And Adams and Lewis were photographed at the front of a crowd going all the way down Broad Street, a thick, thick crowd with hundreds and hundreds of people. It was like when the Duke of York, Sir Roy Trotman, led his march back in, I think it was 1993. And as a result, the Central Agency was forced to treat Lewis rather better, but they would not rehire him, and nobody else would. So he got a decent payout, apparently, and he gave it all to his wife and 10% to the union itself, which he had been running to assist with their finances. And he lived on charity for the rest of his life. He lived on the charity of friends, but chiefly Mr. Frank Colomer of Frank Colomer Hall, of our great literary icon. He lived on the charity of Frank and his wife, Ellis. And he ate dinner every night of the week at their house and it was possibly about all that he ate for the day. And he lived like that. He fell out with Grantley Adams because he was so strong and so passionate in trying to get Grantley Adams to do the right thing, including free education, which Grantley Adams, for some reason, did not pursue. And so when Errol Barrow formed his party, 
in the early 50s, Lewis fell in with, with Barrow. But again, he was trying to persuade Barrow to do too much. And in the final analysis, they weren't as close as they had been. And when he was only, I think, 56, he went off to St. Lucia, where one of his daughters was getting married. And would you believe that on the morning of the wedding, he died of a heart attack? This is a story. He was in his middle 50s, and I suspect that he probably died of what we call the heart failure of beriberi, which is a malnutrition condition, because he was clearly living a very, very difficult life. He failed to get elected just before that, on the very last time that he ran for election, because in those days people ran as independents, and independents got elected. Most of the parties, most of the parliamentarians were in fact independent, and a rumour was put out by his opponents that he had died. And so here is a man who had sacrificed everything. He was a remarkably bright man and a personable man, who had come from abject poverty to become influential in politics in the way that no single man, unless prime minister, or no single woman, unless prime minister, can have that kind of influence today. His influence on the life of people, on the society, and on the whole political spectrum was really quite amazing. And so once again, I feel that here is a man who had illuminated politics in Barbados, who had sacrificed everything, he lost his livelihood. He lost the love of his wife who eventually left him. She could not live in this situation and she left him with his three daughters and he lost his health. So he lost his livelihood, he lost his love and he lost his life eventually, like Colonel Wickham, dying far before his time for the cause which he supported. And I passionately believe that only Busser, or Busa, as, uh, as Professor Richard Alsop said, only Busa or Busa did more and lost more. He lost his entire life for his beliefs in 1816. And I think that Wickham and Lewis are the most prominent heroes because I believe that a hero has to have truly sacrificed with his courage. And many of our people today who are recognized as national heroes were great men, but they are what I would call patriots. They were great men who did a lot for Barbados, but they did not have to sacrifice. I suppose that you might say that uh, Charles Duncan O'Neill's life eventually was a bit of sacrifice and Sir Grantley Adams was sacrificed. But our other national heroes were, and, and Sarah Angel took some risks in her life but again, she was an interesting person because she was born not quite with a silver spoon in her mouth, but she was given the silver spoon when her father died. And she inherited slaves and she bought further slaves and she was a slave owner. But Wickham and Lewis sacrificed everything. And they are our most outstanding national heroes after Bassa in everything but the official recognition, which I do hope will come. Well, it is now over to us to pass on this information about the men and women who contributed to the development of Barbados and in so doing, inspired our people. Thank you, Sir Henry. Next week's presentation of Our Heritage will be preempted to facilitate my colleague Joshua Hinkson's presentation of St. Lucy Speaks. I'm Rashid Best. This has been Our Heritage. <laughs>